So, hi, Caleb. Thank you so much for joining me on Millennials Planning today. Sure. Glad to be here as always. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm so glad that you uh, agreed to join me. Um, I know that you have a long history in activism and journalism, um, and you were a part of the um, Occupy Wall Street movement. That's huge. And uh, you since then have been doing excellent um, journalism and book writing. Um, so tell me a little bit about, uh, tell me a little bit more about your career and um, yeah, like just give me a little intro and then we'll just hop into some convo. Oh, when I was in Cleveland, uh, I got involved in socialist and Marxist activism. I was involved in a lot of protests against police brutality when I was a college student and afterwards. Eventually, I moved to New York City because I couldn't really financially support myself in Cleveland with a dying Midwestern economy. When I got to New York City, it was just about time for Occupy Wall Street to start, so I was part of that. Um, I was well known within the Occupy Wall Street circles. I went to the, some of the planning meetings and such. Then after that, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I got to travel around the world. I was speaking at international conferences in Iran, in Venezuela, in Brazil and such. Uh, I became a commentator on international media. And uh, then I started doing reporting for international media. And uh, yeah, I'm a journalist and political analyst. I've written several books. Uh, I've traveled around the world. I consider myself to be a socialist and an anti-imperialist. Uh, and uh, struggling for justice at the same time, trying to expose the truth in a world of lies. Awesome. And you you write for RT as well, or have done videos for them? Is that correct? Well, that's my job. Yeah, I'm I'm the yeah, New York correspondent of, of RT News. That's what I do. Um, but you know, I also I also do my own They're podcast. I have my own YouTube channel. Like and stuff, so. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? I said they're not a bad word here, so you can say you don't have to say some foreign. You can say RT. It's okay. <laughs> Hey, you can go to my channel. You can watch my work at RT. Very proud of it. Absolutely. As you should be. It's excellent work. And, um, you know, in general, I think RT does excellent work for the most part. So uh, that's great. So thank you so much for speaking with me. I mean, your history and activism has been a bit longer than mine, for sure, because I'm just getting into things here. Uh, so I was really pleased when you agreed to talk to me. And thank you so much for uh, featuring my speech in um, one of your videos recently. That was very flattering. Thank you. Um, well, that was a great demonstration. Uh, in your speech, you know, you don't know me. Uh, that was pretty powerful stuff, uh, you know, speaking for a generation. And it was a great gathering, uh, you know, that Medicare for All march. But it was interesting because, uh, you know, I was expecting that march to be, you know, a lot of AOC and Bernie fans. Instead, it was a lot of people who used to be AOC and Bernie fans who feel like they got sold out. And so it had quite an interesting tone. I was glad to be able to uh, to attend that, to do some video recording and interviews with people there. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a big divide on the left right now, right? That's, you know, essentially we're sort of forming almost two uh, sects, a, le a left left, and then like a progressive left, which is, you know, the AOC middle ground left. And, um, you know, I, if we were like Europe or like European countries and had many parties, I would assume that we would have different parties for those ideologies. But uh, since we're all stuck in the duopoly at this moment, um, we have to we have to have these fights. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, a lot of people, you know, are very, very pissed off like I was um, at the AOC progressive crowd for not showing up to the Medicare for all marches for not fighting for this for not fighting for the eviction crisis until like right now i mean you, i saw them sleep on the steps of the capitol and that was nice but where were you a month ago on that you know i mean seriously this has been coming down the pipeline for a long time and where where is everybody on this where is everybody on this i see uh you know status quo reporting on it i see uh um the uh, working families party doing stuff and I see the poor people's campaign doing stuff and the rest of us have been you know I mean me too me too I'll call myself out for that because I was so focused on the Medicare for all march and now there's going to be a million homeless people that I didn't do anything about so um, that's horrifying and uh, we need another stimulus for sure so anyway we, we don't have to get off on a thing but um, yeah so uh, so I, I've been looking a little bit more into uh, some of your recent speeches. I, I saw that you had one um, just after the march. Well, I don't know if it was Monday or what, but um, you had you had one in Central Park um, that I thought was excellent. And uh, in that you spoke about, um, you know, uh, 
how, or in a couple of things I've seen you speak about uh, socialism in this country and how it should be, um, you know, like an American flavor of socialism. Like everybody who, who attacks us, you know, likes to say Russian or, you know, you like China, you don't want to be like China, whatever, whatever. But like, yeah, we're, we're American and our communism is going to be different. Our socialism is going to be different. So yeah, do you want to talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. Well, this notion that socialism and communism are foreign to the United States, that's just a bunch of malarkey. I think that's the word Joe Biden would use. He'd say it's a bunch of malarkey. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the first person to use the word socialism in the English language was Robert Owen. Uh, and uh, Robert Owen, you know, he was originally from Wales, but he set up shop in Indiana and he built a socialist, you know, community in New Harmony, Indiana. Uh, and he actually was invited to give a, a speech to a joint session of the US Congress about socialism. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a socialist Baptist minister named uh, Francis Bellamy, um, you know, uh, but you can go beyond that. You know, who are the two most beloved presidents in American history? They do polls, which presidents do people think are the best? It's Lincoln and Roosevelt. Well, it just so happens that those two presidents were the ones who worked closely, the most closely with communists, right? Lincoln had a communist general in the Union Army named uh, named August Willick. He was a brigadier general who led soldiers into battle. Uh, Lincoln was endorsed by Karl Marx. And actually, the New York City uh, a Republican Party newspaper during the Civil War, uh, the New York Tribune, had Karl Marx as their London correspondent. And Karl Marx wrote glowing articles about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and Roosevelt, uh, you know, he was a Democrat. Lincoln was a Republican. But, uh, but uh, you know, Roosevelt met with communist labor organizers at the White House, um, so much so that when uh, Congress investigated Roosevelt for his relationship with the Communist Party, and they called Gilbert Green, who was a, a communist youth activist uh, in, in New York City, they called him before Congress, Roosevelt let him sleep over at the White House to make a statement like, I've got your back now that Congress is investigating me for your ties. So Roosevelt had communists actually sleeping over at the White House. So the two most beloved presidents in US history are the ones who had the closest relationship with communists. Uh, I think that shows that, that there's a lot in US society that we can get behind. And there's a lot of confusion. You know, one thing that, that is interesting is, you know, there's all this talk of like, we, they portray socialists as if they're lazy. Have you heard this? Like, we're all lazy. We would just want to hand out and all of that. But um, it's interesting because, you know, the American spirit, there is this kind of- But that's how they depict the poor as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The American oh. spirit, there is this kind of go get them, work hard, achieve your dreams. Uh, and one of my favorite writers is a woman named Anna Louise Strong, uh, who was an American journalist from Seattle. Um, and she moved to the Soviet Union during the 1930s. And in her book, I Change Worlds, she talked about how that go get them, you know, motor mindedness, go out and achieve your dream spirit had kind of died in the United States during the depression where people were hungry and starving on the streets. But she said she saw it in the Soviet Union uh, because people were working hard to collectively build up their country with the five year economic plans to, you know, to, to electrify the country, to wipe out illiteracy. There was this go get them spirit. She said the Soviet Union is the new America and communism is 20th century Americanism. That's what Anna Louise Strong wrote about. So I think that, that there's a lot of misconceptions and confusion. Um, but it is disturbing that, you know, really since the 50s, our whole identity as Americans has been tied up with this rugged individualism, this indifference to other people, uh, this belief that we're all in it, you know, on our own and such. That's that's not uh, that's not what the country is all about. I mean, we know about racism and sexism. We know about segregation. We know about the murder of the Native Americans. But the point that I've always made is while all those evil things were happening, people were fighting back. People were resisting, you know, there, there were people opposing those wars, there were people fighting to abolish slavery, people like John Brown, people like Harriet Tubman, uh, there were people fighting for civil rights, there were people fighting for the rights of women, the right of women to vote, and those people, many of whom were communists, are just as much part of American history as the bad folks, um, and if we hand over what it means to be an American to Donald Trump or to Joe Biden, and we let them tell us what it means to be an American, we're surrendering, we're just giving up. One thing I, I will say is I've been to a lot of international communist gatherings in Latin America and in Russia and other places. And one thing I always get asked is what's wrong with American communists? Why are American communists so weird? Uh, you know, because it's true, because if you know, communists in Brazil, they don't say fuck Brazil. Communists in Peru, they don't say fuck Peru. Communists in Russia, they don't say fuck Russia. Right. Communists in other countries are professional politicians that actually aspire to take leadership in the country and implement a socialist program. Uh, but in the United States, we have this kind of fringe, you know, it's kind of cut off from the rest of society. We light the American flag on fire. We say all Americans are evil and we're the we're the good ones. And you know, I mean, it's just this weird kind of isolated fringe 
uh, that, is, that is what it means to be a leftist in America. And that's not how it is in the rest of the world. And if we're going to be serious, I mean, if we actually want to move toward, you know, building a socialist America, winning health care for all, education for all, jobs for all, we want to do these kind of things, uh, we need to act like we actually want to run the government. Like, not, not that we want to tear the country up with chaos, that we actually want to run the government. So, you know, that's, you know, people on, on my YouTube streams, uh, people call me a suit socialist. I kind of joke about that, you know, the suit socialists. Um, but, you know, there's something to that, right? I mean, you know, put on a suit, act like a serious politician, right? And I don't like, unfortunately, in the United States, if you advocate socialism, it seems like you have two choices, right? On the one hand, you can be part of that crazy fringe that's like selling newspapers about Trotsky and screaming and yelling and, and all of that. Or there's this other option where you can be somebody who just kind of campaigns for the Democrats and does whatever the Democratic Party says. And maybe once a year you read some marks, but at the end of the day, you're just a Democratic Party functionary. But around the world, that's not how it is. You know, I mean, you go to countries like India, where they have millions of people in their communist parties, they run entire regions. You go to countries like Angola or Vietnam, where the communists are in power, they're not fringe crazy extremists, but they're also, they're not selling out their ideals. They, these people can talk to you about Marx and Lenin and socialism and their vision for raising people up out of poverty in their country. Uh, they can talk with a great deal of depth about their politics while at the same time, uh, you know, they, they, can, they are serious and they lead millions of people. That's what we need in the United States. We need serious 21st century socialism. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And yeah, so let's get a little deeper in on that because um, <clears throat> I absolutely agree. And I think that there's a huge gap between how, um, you know, traditionally boomers and Xers have seen socialism and how we view socialism. And there's a big reason for that. Um, they, you know, they experienced economic hardship. I'm not going to say that they didn't, but when we graduated into the recession and the only jobs that were available were service jobs, retail jobs, you know, sling and coffee, whatever, that, that really puts you in touch <laughs> with what it's like to be a worker. Right. And that's not something I had personally experienced either. I mean, I, I grew up, uh, my mom was a teacher in private schools. And so I always went to private schools because she taught at them. And, um, you know, I grew up in a bubble because of that. And then when I got into the real world and I started doing these jobs and I said, oh, like they not only want to keep you on slave wages, they want to treat you like that too. You know, I mean, that's a whole, it's, it's a whole other level of immediacy for our generation. Like we, it's not, it's not some, you know, like, Russia versus America. It's not some, you know, like, like foreign invasion idea, right? Like this is very central to who we are as a generation because we got the boot and we got it hard. Um, so <clears throat> like when, you know, when we talk about socialism for our generation, I think that, you know, it's very, very helpful as as you do to to present that this is a new you know this is our interpretation of socialism this is not uh you know not a dictatorship right because we have to keep emphasizing over and over again that socialism and communism are not necessarily uh methods of government they're so they're economic systems and that does not imply fascism fascism can arise in anything Right. So that's why you see that there have been fascist uh, dictators in socialist governments. I mean, even the Nazis were socialist. Right. They called themselves socialists, even though the, in practice it was very different. Right. And you have to start saying you have to start realizing that, you know, when we when we talk about. When, you know, when we talk about uh, inequality and when I, I feel I feel like if I'm going a little bit all over the place, no, I apologize. Go ahead. But, um, you know, like when we talk about inequality, when we talk about, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, the idea of working, pulling yourself up from your own bootstraps, which, by the way, is a complete lie. And I possibly you know that better than me, because <laughs> pulling your pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, that phrase was uh, used to mock how little capitalists care about their workers. And they literally said, what do you expect us to do? Pull us up, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And now it's become so in, in part ingrained in our, you know, psyche that we say it like we should be doing that. When in reality, nobody has actually done that. 
nobody has actually done that. There have been people that have started out life poor and ended up rich, but it's not because they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. It's because they had an angel investor or they had benefits from the government. And where do those benefits come from? They come from taking them from other people. And so that's why we cannot all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps because your socialism, your prosperity depends on my suffering. And that's something that we have to keep driving home every day, especially when we have these philosophical conversations, because it makes it personal. We, this is, you're taking from me, you're stealing my fucking labor, right? This is not, you know, this is not about, oh, well, I have the same option that you do to just make money and make money and make money. You know, I mean, I work harder than a lot of people who make a lot of money, you know, a lot more money than I do. And I am just surviving paycheck to paycheck, barely. I mean, like I'm, you know, I'm a month behind in my rent. I always am because I have to pay rent. I have to pay bills. I have to pay rent. I have to pay bills. And I don't have any money in between. And that's just fucking how life works, you know? And it's not that I don't work hard. I work fucking like 17 hour days. You know, I, I work for, I work for a doctor. Um, I work, I take care of his daughter who's special needs and he works very hard. I'm not going to say he doesn't work hard. But the, but the amount uh, that society has deemed that his labor is worth is so vastly much more than mine that I could work so hard 24 seven and not even come close to, the, to his earnings because society does not value my labor anywhere near what they value a doctor's labor. And what I do is essentially nursing. Mm -hmm. And what I do is take care of a young girl's life and there are moments in my day where if I dropped her, if I wasn't paying attention, you know, I could kill her, right? I have somebody's life in my hands and I make literally like literally 2% of what this guy makes, right? Anyway, so that was a huge rant. Do you want to jump in and say anything about that? <laughs> There's a couple of things I, I wanted to talk about. I mean, first of all, you know, I guess, you know, when you talk about fascism and socialism and these things, Let's talk about that because, um, you know, so the socialist countries of the world, you know, countries where working class people have risen up and taken control of the government, uh, almost immediately they become under attack. I mean, 15 different countries, including the United States, invaded Russia right after the Russian Revolution. Uh, and, you know, and in the context of being barricaded and bombarded, these countries do become very, very authoritarian. You know, I mean, you know, you go to Cuba, they're facing an economic blockade. There were like, you know, over 400 attempts to kill Castro and all of that. And they become, you know, the military is a very big part of life there. They don't have the level of human rights that we have. And, and if we want those societies to become more open, uh, to maintain their socialist system, but also have a higher level of freedom, uh, what we need to do is, is get the USA to leave them alone and get the USA to stop trying to, to overthrow their, their system. But fascism is something different. You know, the Nazis, they used socialism in their name. It was National Socialist German Workers Party, but it was capitalism. It was very much, they never changed property. It was very much a, an economy organized to make profits for a group of owners. You know, it was the Krupps and the Tysons. And, and actually Hitler didn't come to power except because there was a banker named Hollemer Schacht uh, who, who basically was a German banker who picked him out and said, this is our guy and took him to all the other wealthy people in Germany and said, it's either the communists or this guy, so we'll take him. Um, and before that, he was getting funded by the British, actually. The British were using him to fight communists in the streets of Germany. But fascism, what, what Nazi Germany was, what Italy was under Mussolini, what Pinochet was in, in Chile, uh, what Franco was in Spain, that is what happens when capitalism enters a big crisis, like what we're in now, right? When there's instability in society, uh, when the not only are the working people, you know, seeing their wages go down and their living standards drop, but also among the capitalists, their profits are decreasing and such. The capitalists begin to fight with each other and they all want the government to come in and stabilize the economy. They want the government to use force to stabilize the economy, but they want it to use force on all the other capitalists. They don't want the government to, to take their property. They don't want the government, you know, they want government stabilization of the economy, but they want it it's all the other capitalists expense, not, not theirs. And so one section of the ruling class will battle with other sections to try and take control of the government. And that's what we're seeing right now with, you know, the fight in power between, you know, Trump and, uh, and the, you know, the, the liberals. And there's various factions kind of battling for power. They all want to end the crisis, but they want the other folks to pay for it. Um, and fascism is a particular form of that, where one faction of the ruling class takes control of the government. They use the government to suppress other sections of the ruling class. 
And then they try to stabilize society with mass destruction and violence and terror. Um, and that's what we saw in Nazi Germany, that you know, the one particular faction among the German capitalists took power in Germany. Uh, it was with Holliber Schacht and, and some of the other like industrialists and bankers, they took power in Germany. And then they, they immediately, they, they put half the, half the country practically in concentration camps, locked up all the communists, locked up all the labor union bosses, labor union leaders. And then they started military spending again and started using you know, the spending on militarism. And they were able to kind of stabilize the economy for five or six years and get Germany out of an economic crisis. But it only worked for five or six years because then they had to start World War II because their economy was about to come to a halt again. And that's what fascism is. And we're, our, our society, I would argue, is moving toward fascism. Uh, I don't think Trump is a fascist, and I think people saying that were hysterical. I don't think, and and that that kind of like that hysteria about oh my God, Trump is a fascist. You know that that was used to kind of silence criticism of the Democrats, and that was that's a useful tool. But I think that you know that there are you know as we see more authoritarianism, as we see a prison industrial complex, uh, you know I mean these you know as we see an increased call for censorship, uh, there's an increasingly a call for censorship that there's. There's elements of fascism, you know, in the air right now, and that as society becomes more and more unstable, and as working people begin to rise up and fight for their rights, there there may be uh, more of a fascist impulse on on part of the, you know, on, on different factions of the ruling class. Um, and that's this is the natural this, this is the natural development of what happens when capitalism is in an economic crisis. When things are good, you know, Ronald Reagan used to say, "We're all friends after six o'clock." Democrats, Republicans, they all get along. We're all friends after six o'clock. Who cares? It's just theater, you know, you know, but nowadays there are real differences among the ruling class. They all need this crisis to end. They see Russia and China rising around the world. They see countries breaking out of their grip. Uh, they see average working people rising up and demanding Medicare for all and protesting in the streets. And they see a country that's furious about the, the low living standards and the police state and all of this. And, and they're afraid and they, they're increasingly discussing mechanisms for stabilizing it. So uh, there you go. That's my take on that whole thing. Awesome. Well said. And I, I want to build on some of the points you were making there. Um, I, I think it's important to remember when we talk about fascism, when we talk about, you know, these uh, comp, uh, socialism, they're, they're all kind of are able to exist within the same society sometimes, right? Like there are elements of fascist behavior in America that, you know, I mean, the whole prison system is fascist, right? I mean, the, uh, you know, that exists for the underclass essentially, whereas the overclass gets socialism essentially. If you have enough money, you don't have to worry about getting your bills paid. You don't have to worry about Medicare, healthcare. You know, I, you, you have, you pay enough to reach a certain level, and then you reach that utopia that socialists talk about in this country. So the fact that these two things do exist, uh, you know, as well as other elements of other ideologies, should say to you that you know we cannot look at other governments and say, oh, this is just a fascist government and they're terrible and you know whatever. I mean, we have elements of both here. We have elements of both in every country because these are concepts. And we are talking about vague concepts that uh, we are trying to make a point with, right? These are essentially, you know, conceptual tools that we are utilizing. And it's not about our utopia is not going to be somebody's definition of exactly what communism is, right? Like that's not happening. Like our, our, our utopia will grow from what we create, right? So it's not something that we're going to be able to plan. It's not 100%. We're going to have to have a plan to get there. But we can't, you can't, you know, say it's going to be exactly like Star Trek or something because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Um, because you, societies grow and you can't predict, you can't predict the future and you can't predict how things go. And you just have to be able to put your energies in the proper direction uh, or in the direction that you deem proper, essentially, um, to to then, you know, see what happens next. So I, I think that it's important to, you know, talk about that. I mean, I definitely feel like there's a lot of people online and I don't know a lot about this world, frankly, because I don't have much time to spend in front of a computer anymore. I used to, I used to have a, a, a receptionist job and I used to be in front of the computer all day so I could sort of pay attention to stuff. But like, I, I mean, you know, when it gets into, you know, like the real, 
discussions between, you know, this kind of communism and that kind of socialism and who, who that you follow and what theory and barp barp. Like, I, I just can't, I don't, I don't know enough about that stuff to go there. And it seems to me like there are a lot of people that I've spoken with that are frustrated um, by that kind of conversation because it's not helping us now. It's not helping our daily realities because at the end of the day, those kind of conversations need to come when we've reached a different plateau. We're still in a plateau, you know, where we're fighting slavery essentially, right? So like, let's, you know, abolish slavery first and then maybe we can, get into some of the other quibbles here. So I don't know, I, that's what I like to think about that. Um, you know, it was, uh, I also, uh, yeah. I also watched um, the debate that you had with, uh, oh my God, his, in Augustus Invictus the <laughs> third. So when I say that I have no idea about these online fights and shit, I have no idea who that is. And I still don't. And I have no, no intention of looking it up. He seems like a person indeed. Um, he <laughs> actually, the first thing I thought when I saw him was that's a fucking Slytherin. That is a Slytherin. <laughs> As a side note, are you a Harry Potter fan as a millennial? Well, uh, my mother was a children's librarian. Uh, <gasps> I, I, we even got a copy of Harry Potter before it was published uh, in the United States. Uh, it was the Philosopher's Stone. It was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone when we first read it. Uh, it hadn't even been uh, Americanized to be the Sorcerer's Stone yet. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. And uh, that debate with Augustus Invictus was quite interesting. Uh, you know, so I guess what it was, was there was a friend of mine who like keeps track of different political people. And he saw that Augustus Invictus, this well-known white supremacist, racist, or whatever, had put on his social media that he wanted to debate an actual communist. And my friend said, oh my God, it's gotta be you. And so I, I reached out to him and, and we did it. And I will say it was, I, it was one of the most nerve wracking things because you know um, we rented a, a small like theater in New York City for the evening, right? Um, and like, I, I only invited, we invited like 10 of his people and 10 of my people. We got a camera crew and we did it. Um, and we didn't even announce that we were gonna do it. It was like undisclosed or whatever. It was just a, a shoot basically. And we filmed it and then posted it afterwards. But, uh, but what happened was immediately I started getting all these messages like, hey, tell us where it's gonna be. Hey, I'm a big fan of your work. Where is this gonna be? It was like, it was Antifa wanting to come and like kick his ass, you know what I mean? Um, and then also I brought my audience members. There was a lot of people that very vehemently disagreed with him. And then his audience was like some proud boy kind of people. And at one point there was a scuffle in the audience, uh, you know, between, you know, there was, there was a little bit of a scuffle in the audience between, between, between one of my fans and one of his fans uh, that we had to like break up. It was, it was a little bit nerve wracking. And so after it was over, I was like, Jesus Christ, did that just happen? Like that was, that was wild. Um, so then afterwards, uh, uh, like two weeks later, Charlottesville happened, okay? And he was one of the main speakers at Charlottesville. So I thought, okay, now we have to, we quickly edited the video and we put it up on the internet. And, uh, and Julian Assange liked it. He tweeted it out to all of his followers. He said, you gotta watch this. And interestingly, I got a lot, of, a lot of people watch it and they said, you did a really good job by, by putting forward kind of a socialist message. You were able to debate this guy in a way that liberals can't. Generally, the way liberals debate racists and the alt-right and people like that is the, the alt-right person will come up there and they'll say something really offensive. And the liberal will go, oh my God, look at what you just said. That's so racist. And they'll go, yeah, I'm racist. What are you gonna do about it? You know, and, and that's how the debate goes, right? And it's, it's like, it's awful, right? But when you actually can put forward a real socialist program, you know, to address the issues that the, the racist is saying that their demagogy and their racism and their hate will address, when you say, actually, no, the solution is black and white unite and fight, the solution is class solidarity, you can refute their ideas very effectively. Um, and that's something that liberals cannot do because liberals at the end of the day are defenders of the status quo. And the whole reason people turn to those ideas is that they don't like the status quo. And so that's why I feel like it's really important that leftists debate these folks. Um, and that there's no platform ideology that, that says we should never answer these ideas. You should just, you know, we should just cancel, you know, just cancel these people, never, never engage with them. That, that helps them at the end of the day because it makes them look like the victim. Their ideas never get answered, never get refuted um, and they benefit, um, you know, at the end of the day and the left just look like stooges for the status quo. 
Um, and uh, so my position, and he's not the only person on the far right I've debated. I've debated far rightists on many occasions. I debated Stefan Molyneux, uh, Stefan Molyneux, the libertarian anarcho-capitalist. He and I had a, a two hour discussion about the fall of the Soviet Union in which uh, he got very fired up and all of that. And I just kept you know, sticking to the facts. I had data and numbers and we had a conversation and I'm not afraid to do that. I've debated leftists as well. I've debated some of these, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that whole thing about drawing up a blueprint. Uh, when I debated Destiny, Destiny Stephen Bunnell, who's this big YouTube guy who plays video games and debates people, I debated him and he kept asking me for like exactly the blueprint of the socialist America, right? He wanted exactly, exactly what the socialist America is gonna look like. Um, you know, how many fries will you get when you order a hamburger in the socialist restaurant in the future of socialist America? And I kept saying, we can't do that because socialism isn't gonna be built by me. It's gonna be built by a mass movement of people with many different perspectives, many different views coming together and saying, we need to get beyond capitalism. And that's a scientific approach. There's a difference between utopian socialism and scientific socialism. Scientific socialism sees socialism emerging as a result of the struggles that you're describing. People not being able to pay their bills, people being hungry, people coming together and taking care of each other as the system leaves them behind and, and ultimately coming together and taking control of the banks and the factories and the industries and forcing them to work for this, the society overall and for public good, not for the profits of a small group of owners. That's what socialism is. But, um, but if socialism is just your favorite blueprint, anybody, anybody can do that. And also that's a cheap debating tactic because no one's going to be able to design a perfect blueprint, right? You can pick a hole in any, you know, if you force someone to draw out a complete complex model of everything, uh, you can pick a hole in anything. So that's, that's a common, you know, dishonest, disingenuous debating tactic. I think, you know, Destiny is, uh, you know, he's been playing a lot of SimCity. You remember SimCity, the computer game? He's been playing a lot of SimCity. He wanted me to play SimCity with him. And I said, Destiny, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you about how history works. I'm trying to talk to you about the objective laws of historical development. I'm not trying to talk to you about playing SimCity. So there you go. Oh, geez. I mean, I mean that's, uh, that's politics in the age of uh, clickbait, right? Fuck. <laughs> Sim City. I'm surprised he wasn't playing um, uh, Civilization. Yeah. <laughs> that go. that was a great that was a great video game that really um, there's like Civilization. I don't know up to eight maybe at this point. I don't know. There were so many versions of it, but you, it was I think a board game first, and then it was a. I'm not. I can't completely be sure of that. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so that that was an interesting game where it at least like broke down how society was run and like how you can take over, you know, neighboring countries and stuff like that. It was like one of those games. It was like it was like risk, but a lot more nerdy, <laughs> if you can imagine. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, I think you said a lot of awesome stuff there. And I think that, um, you know, I'm thinking back on the on the debate that you guys had. Um, to me, it seemed like a lot of the stuff he said was just naturally from a privileged perspective. Like it just didn't, you know, I mean, it seemed to me like like certain things, like he kept saying, like, well, you know, you have to come back to the family, right? They love to, to, to pull that out because it's very easy to sort of go, gay people, no family, blah, blah, you know, it's very easy to do that. And that's ridiculous to me as a gay person with technically no family because I've created my own family and that should be just as valid as anybody else's family, right? So, you know, it's not, I mean, I think when, when, you know, they, they pitch this stuff at us too. Like we, we need to be like, well, you know, do you really value a family if you encourage an abuse, you know, abused woman to stay with her abusive husband? No. Right. So that's not, that's, that's not a healthy family situation, right? Like you, you would encourage that woman to go find a healthier family situation, going back to her parents or whatever. Um, you, you know, I, I think that, uh, a lot of the things that, he sort of grasped at were, and, and I note, I noted too, that he called the first world war, the great war. He kept referring to it as the great war, which is a very, very, like not even boomer, like silent generation way of referring to it. Right? Like, <laughs> like you read, you read old, like turn of the century books and they call it that, right? Like, <laughs> 
Um, so I thought that was particularly interesting. And it seems to me like, you know, he's grasping at ideas that he was brought up with that feel familiar to him. And then he's created an ideology around those things. And some of that ideology was actually populist, right? Some of the things that he described were populist ideas. And it's that juxtaposition that, you know, that Trump lovers, Fox viewers sort of ride the line of. And it's, and it's that kind of, um, that kind of mix that brings in the, the, the white working class, right? Because the white working class doesn't want to acknowledge that it's, was able to build anything off of anybody else's backs because they were also treated like shit, but they were still given opportunities and other things off the backs of other communities. So, you know, it, when you're like rung number two on the ladder from, you know, upward from shit, then it doesn't really feel that great, you know, to be rung number two and you still hate the ladder, right? But it's important to note that you're still a rung on that ladder and there are still people below you that need your help. So anyway, I think that um, <clears throat> there, there's a lot, I think you got, you did an excellent job of deconstructing this yo-yo. I have no idea again who he is or where he's from, but, you know, I mean, he, I think you did a great job of that. I encourage everybody to go watch that debate. It was, it was excellent. I couldn't possibly summarize it. And, you know, it was a two hour long, excellent intellectual debate. So I thought, I thank you for doing that because you don't know how many times, like I've been in my room, just angry and just like yelling at, you know, conservative people in my head. And I, the conservative people that I had, you know, some sort of general knowledge of like Bill, Bill O'Reilly or whatever, because that's just, you know, the only impression that I had of those people. Um, it's just very easy for them to, to sort of like yell and, and hit these emotional chords. Whereas, you know, we need to get better at that as the left. We really need to get better at being able to emotionally manipulate our audiences. And in not, not in an evil way, but in a way that uh, communicates our message right? In a way that, that helps them feel like we're not just professors talking, you know, to each other about theory. Like we really need to, you know, say like, yes, theory, but this directly affects you because, right? Like this is, this is where it affects your life. And this is why you should be passionate about these things. Right. So I think that we have a lot of work to do on the left about that. And I hope, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll, uh, do, do something with my podcast. I don't know. <laughs> But I know, yeah, I mean, you've done a great job. You've done a great job battling that guy. That was, that was fucking awesome. So well done there. <laughs> well, you know, when you talk about the family, you know, it, it's interesting because I, you know, I'm from a small town in Ohio originally. And I remember, you know, when there, there was a gay marriage, you know, a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage on the ballot in Ohio, I would see this bumper sticker all the time. And it would say a marriage equals one man plus one woman. And then it would have a Bible verse. And I would, I would, you know, point to that and say, yeah, that's funny. How many, uh, how many wives did Ezekiel have? How many wives did Moses have? Uh, how many wives did Abraham have? And the more you, uh, you know, and that's, that, that shows that like, that's, that's ridiculous, right? And that the family has always changed, right? During, you know, most of human history, the majority of human history, we were hunter gatherers in the woods and there was not a, an institution of marriage and the whole tribe of 20 to 30 people was like a family. It was like one big family, you know, and there were couples or whatever, but, but they were one big family and they didn't even really keep track of whose kid was whose kid. It was just kind of, they, they were kids of the whole tribe. The family originated with the origin of private property, with the origin of the private ownership of land. Uh, you know, it was who got the land when somebody died. Well, you had to keep track of who was who and- And, and, and not you know. to interrupt, but the, the, the private ownership of women. Yeah. Private yeah. ownership of slaves. Yeah, also the word family. Private. Yeah. You know, the word family in, in ancient Rome, it referred to all of a man's property, including his wife and children, but also his slaves, also his land, also, you know, it was it was what a man's owns, a man's household basically was his family. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and that that the way human beings, you know, get together, have kids, raise kids has changed in every society. There's no permanent way of doing this. And the same for gender roles, you know, the way masculinity expresses itself in American culture is very different than the way it does in some other cultures, right? And that you know, you go back to there's some Native American tribes that had like 14 different genders. So that, you know, these things are always changing and that that's one thing that the current order will always try to do is say that the way we are 
is the permanent way it must always be. And that's a lie. That's that's just a lie. Um, you know, and it's a lie whenever any order says it. Everything in the world is constantly changing. Um, and that's that's a basic tenet of Marxist philosophy, that all that is solid melts into air. Nothing is permanent in the universe. You never step into the same river twice. Um, but uh, but the, the other thing, though, as I will say, though, that family is very important to a lot of working class people. You know what I mean? Especially nowadays when the economy is so bad and people are struggling to survive, you know, people have to take care of each other. And, and you know, people are kind of driven together. And th this is one of the successful things the right wing has done is they've said, family is a conservative thing. Family is right wing. These people on the left, they want to destroy your family. And, you know, for immigrant communities, uh, you know, I mean, for, for people from ethnic minorities, when, when they hear that someone wants to take their family away, they think, this is something I want to be against. And I think we need to be clear that we're not against the family. I'm not against the family. If people want to get married and have kids, be they, you know, you know, however they want to do it, that's their, that's their life. And, 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 you know, we're, we're not against the family. We just recognize that there's nothing permanent in the universe and people should be able to have their family however they want. If people are gay or lesbian, if people are transgender, they want to do their family that way. That's their business, right? It has nothing to do with us. And, you know, live and let live needs to be our attitude on these things, but we're not, we're not against the family, right? You know, and Mark's talking about being against the family he was against like the patriarchal authoritarian implementation of it and recognizing that it wasn't permanent that it flowed from the economic base as the economy changes and the mode of production changes the family and the way humans relate to each other also changes that's the marxist scientific understanding of that um now as far as the populism thing uh what's interesting is you know you want to well, even go on like let's let's dive a little further into that i love that you that the way that you phrase that um, it, it is, you know, it is about, you know, when you're talking about the family, you are talking about a very specific patriarchal agri agricultural based structure. Um, you know, you are talking about uh, um, the fact that, you know, the man was the head of a farm, essentially, right? And the woman had her place in helping that farm right your family essentially was your means of production right it, and it this is the you know like the settlers mentality right so um that's not something you know that our current system of capitalism uh encourages anymore because because of uh the industrial revolution because because cities are you know, calling workers, young workers specifically, um, to work and then go, you know, back to the suburbs to then procreate, you know, um, and uh, we, we don't, you know, our, our living pattern currently is not, you know, familially based, you know, even, even when you do have a good family structure, right, because you're, I mean, like, before, the 2008 crash and this is how you were supposed to live you were supposed to go away from your parents move out graduate get a job you know move on to your own life right essentially get your own house right you would have a, your mother's house and you would have your house i mean the <laughs> the idea that i would ever own a house is like laughable to me at this point but you know like like that is something that has changed in recent days right so now you have you know, now you have kids that are living with their parents because of economic reasons. And now we're forced back into like a, a nuclear family structure, right? So some of that feels familiar to the white working class because they see their kids on their couch and going like, oh, well, yeah, I guess I have a family and family's important and stuff like that. So, you know, that, that feels familiar, but at the same time, like we have to realize that that's, that's a contract that 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 idea of a familial structure is a contract that you know the the if the, the father of the family has to provide for their family and that means provide you know not only like bread and butter and the roof over your head and whatever the shit but also provide emotionally and then your family has to provide emotionally for that man but if that man doesn't fulfill that contract then he breaks that contract you know what I'm saying? Like then, then that, you know, that contract is no longer valid. Then the family, the idea of the family doesn't exist for that family, right? Because the contract has already been broken. So that's something, you know, I had a discussion once, once upon a time with a woman online who was very, uh, uh, 
Orthodox Jewish. And she was saying, um, you know, the, the Bible says like the woman should be, uh, you know, part like, you know, part of the man's purpose or so I don't know how she phrased it, but, you know, she is subservient to your man and, and you should be in support of him. I mean, and she phrased it in this really loving way. And like she, and I, and I spoke to her and I said, listen, like some people, you know, some people are born into a family where that works. Some people are born into a family where there is love, there is reciprocal, you know, whatever. And then those people are taught to think that that's everybody, mm -hmm. that there are some people that, you know, turn gay and decide to say, fuck you family or whatever, or, you know, like that's not that that re dream doesn't exist for everybody and we have to we have to keep pushing that idea too and we have to keep pushing the idea that you know it even though the conservative you know the conservatives want to reach back into this time where families live together and did things together and whatever you know we are just over decades now have been moving away from that anyway like our capitalist system, the one that, you know, conservatives are essentially holding up and supporting uh, has taken that away from us because we are now supposed to be part of a collective. We're supposed to be part of a corporation. We are not supposed to be part of a family, right? Like what, my dedication is supposed to be to the corporation first over, over children, over, over, you know, my grandpa that I had to take care of, right? So the, that's, that's a whole new you know, that, that system promotes uh, a communistic way of life anyway, you know? So it's, I mean, whether, I mean, whether or not that it's governed by a hierarchy or whether or not it's governed by some more equitable system, I mean, that is just, um, you know, that is just how our society is going. So I'm completely agreeing with you that, you know, we're, we are just ob observing the patterns that ca capitalism has taken us towards, right? I mean, like you can't undo capitalism of the past, right? So we are we are dealing with the the, the currents and eddies of our uh, history um, in this as well. So anyway, yeah, please, I, I see you want to say something. Please go ahead. Well, I mean, there's a couple things I could say. Um, I, I mean, as as far as what you were talking about there. Um, you know, it's interesting because Nicaragua, uh, they have a socialist government there, the Sandinistas. And I have never seen a more pro-family government than Nicaragua. I mean, the slogan that you see painted everywhere, the slogan of the government is Christianity, socialism, and solidarity. Um, and they have another slogan, which they've used, which is grow where you are planted. Because all over Latin America and all over the developing world, you know, younger people from the countryside, and just like here in the United States, I mean, I'm from Ohio, I had to move to, to the New York area because, you know, young people from rural areas, young people from less developed regions move to the cities to, in order to survive. And then that's where, you know, you tend to have a lot of drug use, you tend to have a lot of like social isolation and loneliness. But in Nicaragua, uh, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the rural areas, they're saying grow where you are planted. And they're trying to bring economic development to rural areas so that younger folks can stay in the town they grew up in, uh, but economically prosper. And that, you know, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx talks about breaking down the division between city and countryside. Um, and that, you know, the Sandinistas, they're widely maligned in US media, brutal dictatorship, authoritarian regime. But if you go there, it's a socialist government. And if you compare them to Honduras, where Hillary Clinton overthrew, uh, overthrew the elected government of Manuel Zelaya and now has the highest murder rate in the world, mass poverty, people are piling in on our border to get out of there. You compare it to Guatemala, you know, where there's been a, a number of US backed military regimes and mass poverty and suffering. You go to Nicaragua, where they have, you know, Christianity, socialism, and solidarity. The Sandinistas are in power, and uh, you know they're a little bit socially conservative. I would say they're really not. You know, abortion is, you know, very, very strictly not allowed. And I, I'm pro-choice. I think that that's not good. But overall, you know, they have a very, very socialist economy, a very left-wing, you know, society uh, where people are given jobs and healthcare, and they have a micro entrepreneurship program where the government like loans people money to start their own businesses, and and they're working with China. They want to build a new canal that will counter the Panama Canal. Um, but it's socialism done in a very kind of religious, Christian, and pro-family way. And I think that's particularly interesting. And it shows, you know, I mean, you know, I'm a Christian. I, be I believe in, in Jesus Christ and, and such. I'm, I'm more of a liberal Christian. I'm not a fundamentalist. But uh, but at the same time, I don't think that, you know, this idea that, that, that communists are anti-God or anti-religion, that's a little bit outdated. 
And that flows from the fact that in, in Russia and in China and in you know, Cuba and, and these countries that were having revolutions around the 20th century, the church was very much an institution that was upholding the old feudal system. And so it was a target when they, when they wanted to have a revolution as part of that was overthrowing, you know, the czar was like the Pope uh, of Russia. He was the head of the Russian Orthodox Church and he upheld this feudal system where, you know, peasants were on the land and were like the property of the landowners and such. And so that was a target in the Russian revolution. And I mean, you know, the French revolution was very anti-religious too. That wasn't a socialist revolution, but it had a very anti-religious character to it. But nowadays things have changed. I mean, you know, Maduro, the leader of Venezuela, he's Roman Catholic. Uh, you know, Evo Morales, the leader of socialist Bolivia was, was also Roman Catholic, uh, you know, and in the Islamic world, you know, Syria, you know, you have Baathist Arab socialism and uh, Islam is like recognized in the Syrian constitution as a, a big part of, of the government there. And so, you know, I think we, we ought to get past this idea that, that socialists and communists are opposed to people being religious and, and such. That, that's not necessarily correct. But at the same time, I am, I am pretty much socially liberal. I think people should be able to live as they live. You know, people are LGBT. That's their business. It's not mine. You know, uh, you know, abortion, again, you know, there's no way we can prove this is a life or this isn't a life. So if we, we can't prove that. The government shouldn't be telling people one way or another, you know, and that it's it is, you know, it's a woman's body, her choice at the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I tend to be socially liberal, but I also want to get away from the cancel culture. I want to get away from this notion. You know, I, I will work with with people that are, you know, Christians or, or Jewish or, or Muslim who, who don't agree with me on that. And I don't care. You know, if you want to work for socialism, if you want to work for a society where profits are not in command and you have this, you know, this perspective, I respect that and I'll work with you and we need to get past this, this canceling of everybody, you know, I, I will tell you, I have a great amount of admiration for Minister Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam, you know, I, I'm not a Muslim and I'm not black and they would never want to recruit me I'm a white guy and I'm a Marxist, but I went to Iran uh, with them to, you know, to some international conferences and, and I've seen the work that they've done against police brutality, you know, police brutality now it's the hip issue to talk about Matt, black lives matter is everywhere it's on CNN. But I'll tell you, you know, back in 2008, 2009 in Cleveland when I was in college and I would go to court with police brutality victims and stuff, it was not the hip issue to talk about. And I would tell people that I was in college with about these cases where police just terrorize people and get away with it. And people would say, that can't be true. If that was true, it would be all over the media. That's, they must be making that up. It couldn't possibly be this bad. Well, it was this bad. And Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, they were talking about it. And there was a, a great community activist group in Cleveland called Black on Black Crime Incorporated. They were talking about it. Uh, the communist and leftist, you know, Marxist groups were talking about it, but most of society was looking the other way. Well, now things have gotten to the point that society can't look the other way. Um, and now you'll notice that it's, it used to be the black community was very, very explicitly targeted and, and this wasn't affecting most other constituencies. But now you're seeing a huge police state crackdown uh, throughout the United States. And, um, you know, I mean, you know, there's been a lot of white people recently who've been targeted now as well. Uh, you know, this, this, the government is out of control. People's rights are slipping away. This is part about building an authoritarian state as the masses are hungry and angry and want some justice. And they're trying to build up an authoritarian state to hold them back. Um, you know, and, and, you know, January 6th, you know, I'm not a QAnon guy. I don't, I don't support what happened on January 6th, but I will say this, Ashley Babbitt, the woman, she didn't deserve to die. We don't have the death penalty for walking around in the US Capitol. And that last time I checked. And even if we did, she would have to get a trial first, right? You know, you'd have to give somebody a trial. The police had absolutely no right to just blow her away because she was trying to, to crawl through a wall or something. They could have handled that many different ways and she did not deserve to die. And I, I, people want to cancel me for saying that, but no, it's, it's a fact. Look, I mean, you know, law enforcement in the United States is out of control. They've been given a license to kill. They've been given a license to tap our phones and read our emails. And uh, anyone who's progressive should be standing up against this wherever it happens, right? If it happens to the right, it happens to the left. We shouldn't be supporting an authoritarian police state crackdown. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Okay. So you covered two topics that I'd like to talk about. <laughs> um, I absolutely want to get to the Jan, the Jan 6 uh, with you. Um, before before we continue, though, I want to ask if you have any time restraints, because I, I know we well, it's about an hour in now. Okay. And Give it another half hour or so. I think we'll be good. Yeah. Good. Okay. No problem. I mean, I'm, I'm free to chat forever. So you, yeah. it's cool. I just want to you know, be sensitive of your time. Um, so just give me a heads up. Let me know. Um, okay. Uh, so what, what was the, what were you talking about right before the 
uh, insurrection. I keep calling it a resurrection <laughs> in my head, but that's not it at all. It's insurrection. <laughs> Police brutality, uh, the police state, uh, yeah. taking away of our rights. Before that, I was talking about, you know, how I will work with people who are socially conservative, even though I don't necessarily agree with them, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think that there is, um, you know, I think that there, because of the uh, uh, George Floyd protests last year, and because there have been there have been so many independent journalists that have not been able to get work, you know, in commercial uh, media outlets, right? Um, they they all put their stuff online, right? And even some even the the major corporate news picked up some of the independent journalists like BG on the scene who had a couple of very instrumental. Uh, uh, clips on on I think on the um, the Kyle Rittenhouse shooting. Uh, so anyway, um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, so I think that there is, you know, there is hopefully starting a shift that the corporate media is not the full story, and indeed it is barely any of the story. It is more like propaganda these days um, because we we're really they're seeing the real picture. Uh, in a way that, you know, we hadn't before, right? Like they talk about that uh, being some kind of turning point when uh, for the, the anti-war movement in the 60s, right? Um, that they saw, uh, you know, Vietnam up close and personal on TV in a way that they hadn't been able to in previous generations because people didn't have TVs, right? So, um, or weren't filming in that, you know, at that level of specificity or whatever. Um, so, you know, that, that is that is a shift I feel that happened with us recently too, um, because we're seeing all these things online up close and personal to our friends, you know, to people that we know. Um, so that it's becoming harder and harder to say, oh, well, it doesn't happen when we're seeing that like, you know, literally, literally every day I see another video of a, a white person that goes crazy on a black person and calls the cops and then the cops are harassing the black person for no reason. Like it's, you know, Every, right it's everywhere we're really beginning to see that and it's and i think that that hopefully is waking people up uh so yeah i absolutely you know absolutely agree with you that we're you know in an increasing police state i i definitely agree that we had been in a police state before but it is getting worse because of uh obama and his militarization uh, or, you know, channeling of military weapons to the police. Um, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, that's just something that's going to keep getting worse and worse. And we're definitely seeing that it's worse from Biden uh, already because he, they all voted, even AOC voted to increase the military budget um, by a disgusting amount and, or I'm sorry, the police budget by a disgusting amount. And um, uh you know, we are, we're seeing, we're seeing conditions worsen on that front. We're seeing um, everything maintain at the border. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't really look like he's going to be any less fascist than Trump at this point. I mean, you're even seeing, you know, censorship online, other podcasts have been censored and, you know, everything. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think that, that we're, you know, because there are several things happening in this country at once. I think that because the the establishment is getting just a teeny bit lazy, um, and uh, that you know Biden <laughs> is in charge of this presidency, and he is definitely not on his tippy top form these days. Um, you know, we have really you know, we're really seeing through a lot of the BS that we were sold years ago, right? They were better at this, like, in the Clinton years, right? Like, this is, that's when they had their heyday, right? Like, you know, I like Thomas Frank a lot, and I read Listen Liberal recently, you know, and he's, he has an excellent, excellent points about uh, how a lot of this crap that we're calling out now started with Clinton, and then was perpetuated by Obama. So, you know, not, and, and Bush and everybody, you know, I mean, everybody seems to be on the same team. I am of that opinion at this point. I personally um, can't really align with either of the two parties at this point. I, I'm, I'm just a straight independent. I, I really can't even say that I'm a green or a MPP or a, you know, whatever at this point. I'm just, I'm just an independent right now. You know, I have sympathies 
Uh, <clears throat> but I, I'm so tired of electoral politics. I'm so tired of, you know, the, well, wait till the moment is right. Well, you know, lesser of two evils. Well, you know, like and none of this represents me. None of you represent me, you know, and I, I'm sick of it. So, um, yeah, I mean, let's also, let's, let's now move into uh, January 6th, unless you wanted to say something else about what I just said. Uh, no. Okay. So yeah. I loved on January 6th, I can't remember where I saw it, but you, you had a take on January 6th um, that, you know, there were also for, foreign, like you said, there was a Korean group. And so elaborate a little bit on that, because I'm going to mess it up if I try to summarize. Well, again, the narrative that we're getting from U.S. media is that this was all just a bunch of mid, mid, middle, middle American rednecks, working class people who are all racist. And they, you know, and there was some of that. Obviously, there were some Confederate flags in the crowd. And this shows that Midwest American folks are a bunch of dangerous rednecks and hillbillies. And Donald Trump is a bad incarnation of them and all of that. Well, that's not the whole story. Uh, and the Gray Zone Project was there on the scene. And they did a very good documentation of the fact. One of the big mobilizers for January 6th is something called the Epoch Times. Have you ever heard of the Epoch Times, the big pro-Trump media outlet? It's run by folks that are not from the Midwest of the United States. They're from China, and they are anti-government activists from China, the Falun Gong religious cult um, that has been trying to overthrow the Chinese government for years, and they are all in for Donald Trump, and they brought thousands of their people out to be part of January 6th. Uh, the Miami Cubans, the folks that are in the streets protesting and trying to bring down the Cuban Communist Party, very right wing, the Marco Rubio crowd, they bust in thousands of their people. And in fact, uh, there's articles where they talk about, you know, the, the Stop the Steal and the Miami Cubans, how they were one of the biggest supporters of that. Um, the, you know, the Moonies, the, church, the, the Moon Unification Church, the followers of Reverend Sun Young Moon, who was this crazy anti-communist pastor from South Korea. Right? They mobilized their people. Uh, they're the ones that had the, the gun ceremony, the blessing of the guns. Uh, Reverend Moon's son, Sean Moon, has a, a church in Pennsylvania, and they have a, this thing called the Rods of Iron Festival every year with the NRA, and they're a Korean anti-communist religious cult. They bust in, and they brought their people. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Iranians of Sunset Park, the Shahs of Sunset Park, the people who were part of the old Pahlavi monarchy that was overthrown in the Iranian Revolution, they bust their people in. Uh, a lot of supporters of Netanyahu were there, the Likudniks. Uh, there were a whole bunch, thousands of Israeli flags in that crowd on January 6th. Um, media doesn't want to talk about this. But the, the reality is that part of what's going on with Trump is that, you know, whenever a country has a revolution, uh, whenever a country starts, you know, breaking out of capitalism and trying to have its own system or whatever, we tend to bring in all the people that are on the losing side of the revolution. And we tend to then sponsor fanatical right-wing extremists to try and work against these governments, right? Whether it's the, the Falun Gong, whether it's the, the Moonies in South Korea, whether it's, you know, we, we tend to sponsor these right-wing extremists, like, you know, the neo-Nazis in Ukraine uh, that, were, that are very anti-Russian that, you know, helped, you know, pull things off in 2014. You know, in Syria, we've been working with the Saudi Wahhabi extremists that, you know, that want to overthrow the Syrian government and replace it with some kind of Saudi authoritarian, you know, Islamic government. Um, and that all over the world, the US government works with these crazy terrorists and extremists and fascists and neo-Nazis, and we bring them in back to the United States. And it looks like some of them, uh, some of them, you know, basically are causing problems over here. Um, and that Donald Trump's base, a lot of it was those folks. It wasn't, you know, average Midwestern Americans. Yes, that was part of it. But it was a lot of uh, a lot of these foreign, you know, constituencies, these immigrant communities that are fanatically anti-communist, uh, you know, that have their own axe to grind, whether it was with Iran or whether it's, you know, with Venezuela or Cuba or whatever. Uh, that's who a lot of Trump's base were. And that's something the media doesn't want to talk about. The media very much likes the idea, oh, average Americans are all, you know, they're, they're, they're racist and, you know, we need to drive down their living standards, their life is too good and, and cancel culture and cancel them. But they don't want to talk about how January 6th was very much the chickens coming home to roost. It was a lot of these extremists from all over the world that we brought to the United States so that our tax dollars have been funding, our CIA has been arming and helping. And these are not healthy folks. <laughs> They're not, look, I mean, and, and it wasn't just January 6th. Uh, you know, I mean, look, they, in, you know, remember the Manchester bombing in Britain when that concert was blown up? Well, the bomber, the bomber himself, uh, Salman Abedi, I believe was his name, 
right? Uh, or no, I, I, what was his name? The, the Manchester bomber. I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but he had fought in Libya against Gaddafi. This guy who blew up a concert, you know, and killed all kinds of people and bombed this concert. He is somebody that the British and American governments have been giving guns to in Libya to fight against the Gaddafi government and against socialism in Libya, right? And US media, they did so much to cover that up. But no, this guy was a Libyan who had been in Libya fighting against Gaddafi with American guns and American taxpayer money. Um, and if you go around the world arming crazy extremists and, and fanatics, uh, you know, eventually they, they do their crazy extremism and fanaticism in a way that harms us as a country. I mean, Osama bin Laden, his whole career started in Afghanistan fighting against the Soviet Union with American guns and Saudi weapons to fight against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So I, I just wanted to highlight that aspect of January 6th, which the media doesn't really want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, that's stuff I had no idea about myself. And that's, I mean, that's, that's nuts. I, I feel like, um, wow. Yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, I feel like I should maybe like, have a disclaimer, though, right? Because I, I, you know, it's so easy to for somebody to hear that and go like, Oh, my God, conspiracy theory, what are you talking about? Blah, 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 right. And, um, but the thing is, like, you know, we have to acknowledge that politics is messy and the people, you know, the people who follow one thing or another are not a unified group, right? So like everybody who follows Trump is not, you know, like a, a Midwestern, uh, you know, working class redneck, I don't even know what, you know, like, no, we, we, there, are, there are many people who support Donald Trump for different reasons. Yes. There are many people of every nationality, as you pointed out, that support Trump for different reasons. And, um, you know, we are, uh, there is, you know, like when, when it comes to talking about, you know, like Russiagate, right? Like the, like, like the left, the indie, the indie left right now is pushing back really hard on Russiagate as they should, I think. Um, because, you know, it's, we have to acknowledge that that international players are always have fingers in everybody's pot, right? Like that's not like it's it's not that like you know we have a new cold war and like Russia came in and infiltrated our government. It's that there are people in Russia, there are people in the Ukraine, there are people in Africa, there are people in UK that have interests financially in America in American politics, right? I mean, it's not. It's it's because uh, because we are our currency is, you know, the you know, the currency for a lot of countries in their own treasuries. It's because um, uh, Saudi Arabia promised to sell, uh, you know, their their oil in the American dollar um, and that we print our own money. Right. We're a fiat currency. So like these are all these are all things that make. Um, <clears throat> the American economy unique. And that's why there are so many foreign players interested in our politics, right? So we have to, we have to sort of acknowledge that uh, on a mainstream level to really then start understanding like how, you know, all of the influences behind some of the, you know, January 6th and all, and all these popular movements, right? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you're, you're speaking out about that because that, that's so interesting and it's not something anybody is willing to speak about. Indeed. Um, and you know, the whole Russia meddling narrative, I mean, my goodness, I mean, this is just the more you, the more, if you know about what's actually going on in the world, I mean, you know, what about Saudi meddling in, in U.S. politics? What about Israeli meddling in U.S. politics? What about Canadian meddling in U.S. politics? I'm concerned about the Canada lobby uh, that's out of control. You know, I'm concerned about the Mexican lobby. You know, Carlos Slim, I bet he, he knows some American politics. This is just silliness, you know, and, it, and it's, it's hysterical. And it, the really, the reason they don't like Russia is because after the Soviet Union fell, Russia's economy was a mess. It was in shambles, right? It was just a disaster. You know, all of a sudden they had mass unemployment, mass hunger. Capitalism, as we're told, it always leads to making everyone happy and all that. But for some reason, when the Soviet Union fell and they adopted free market capitalism, it led to a complete and total disaster in the country. I mean, their economy just shut down. They had to start buying all their food from the USA because their farm system, you know, shut down. It was a nightmare. It was a humanitarian crisis. Like their top population actually decreased by like 10% during that time. People dying, people committing suicide, people you know using opioids, people fleeing and just moving to other countries. I mean, their population went down by 10% during those years. It was a nightmare, right? Um, 
the USA was meddling to get Boris Yeltsin reelected. And, you know, the 1996 elections were very much, they bragged about how Bill Clinton worked very hard to make sure Boris Yeltsin won the elections. But anyhow, uh, the economy was a disaster. Um, and then Putin came along and Putin had written his academic thesis as a college student about how Russia's economy could be reorganized around selling oil and gas, right? That they have a lot of oil, they have a lot of gas. And if they made two giant oil company, an oil company and a, and a natural gas company, two giant state controlled energy companies, they could use that and use the money from that to like reboot the rest of the economy. And he wrote this as his PhD thesis when he was uh, in college. And, you know, he was this guy who was in the security services there and, you know, he got elected and he did it, right? And he fixed Russia's economy dramatically. I mean, you know, you know, 1999, he gets in there. By about 2003, 2004, all of a sudden, Russia's back. Uh, their economy is doing better. Why? Because he has these two giant state-controlled energy companies that are selling oil and gas everywhere. And Bush at attacked Iraq and put sanctions on Iran, drove the oil prices up higher than they ever could be, highest oil prices in history. Um, and as a result of that, Russia was back and their economy did better. Well, now Russia is no longer, you know, just a, a beaten down, destroyed country like it was in the 90s. Now it's a competitor with ExxonMobil and BP and Shell and Chevron. And that's why they don't like Russia. Every ounce of oil and gas the Russians sell is an ounce of oil and gas somebody didn't buy from us. Uh, and that's, it's, it's pure, it's, it's an economic competition. That's why the USA was determined to kill the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, right? Russia and Germany, look at a map. How close is Germany to the United States? How close is Germany to Russia, right? It's just kind of common sense. If you need natural gas in Germany, you're going to import it from Russia, not from all the way across the ocean in the United States. Well, you know, Germany and Russia, they built this natural gas pipeline called Nord Stream 2. And, you know, Obama was screaming about it. He didn't like it. You know, Trump was angry about it. He put sanctions on it. Uh, they did everything they could to stop this. Well, why? The Germans can buy natural gas from whoever they want. The Russians can sell natural gas. How's it our business at all? Well, the USA tried its hardest. It put sanctions on German government officials. It you know, put sanctions on Russian officials. Well, it's going through. It happened. Like the Germans are now buying natural gas from Russia. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline is finished. Um, and the USA is furious about it, but uh, it's, they don't like a competitor, right? Back when China was the sick man of Asia, one of the poorest countries in the world, the USA didn't have an issue with them. Uh, but now that China is the leading producer of steel, half the steel in the world is made in China. They, they have the top telecommunications manufacturer, cell phone manufacturer, Huawei Technologies. Uh, they've lifted their people up out of poverty with a you know largely state-run economy. The economy is kind of, you know, you have a lot of comp corporations and private companies, but you have a five-year plan and you have the Communist Party like basically forcing companies to do what's in the interest of the country's long-term economic growth. Um, now we see China as, oh, our enemy and our competitor. This is what it really gets down to, right? Um, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the rulers of the United States are like mafia gangsters, basically. And uh, the world is their corner. The world is their territory, right? And they, they get to sell the world oil and gas. They get to sell the world steel. They get to sell the world cell phones. And you don't. Uh, and if a country breaks out of that and says, you know, hey, we're going to start selling our own products. We're going to raise our people up out of poverty. We're not going to be a poor, dependent, vassal client state. We're actually going to, you know, organize our economy and raise people up. That's when we have a war with them. You know, Lenin called this system, this, this is a system. This is a global system called imperialism. Lenin called it imperialism the highest stage of capitalism, the rule of monopoly corporations. Uh, and that's what imperialism is. And that's the way the US operates around the world. And for a while, you know, especially like in the 50s, you could argue that average Americans benefited from imperialism, right? Because we were beating down Vietnam, beating down Korea, you know, having coups in Latin America. And average Americans, we got cars and TV sets and refrigerators, and we had a high standard of living. But now in this high tech economy where they've got 3D printers and artificial intelligence, they don't need a well-paid middle class in the homeland anymore. And what they've been doing to Africa and Asia and Latin America for, for centuries, they're now starting to do to Pennsylvania and Texas and Oklahoma and Nevada and Ohio. They're driving down the living standards, right? And, you know, when Trump talks about globalists and all of that, like he's wrong, I guess, but, but he's pointing to something true, which is that these corporations, you know, ExxonMobil, BP, Bank of America, Chase, they don't have any loyalty to this country. 
They are part of a global international system. They're raking in profits from all over the world. And as far as they're concerned, America is just New York City and Southern California and Silicon Valley, right? And the rest of the country, they don't care about, right? They see the USA as a couple trading hubs, a couple, a couple metropolises and a global system of, of free trade where the whole world is getting poorer and they're the global middleman. Right? That's how they see it. And there's a lot of Americans who don't want that. They want to see their living standards go up. They want, to, they want jobs and education. They want a decent life. They want the American dream. Um, and now is the time for solidarity. We got to understand that the same people that are trying to destroy China are trying to destroy our neighborhoods. We have a common interest with these people around the world that are struggling against imperialism. Right? We have a common interest and a common destiny. Um, and that's, that's largely the, the perspective I try to put out, a, a 21st century socialist, anti-imperialist perspective. That's my view. Capitalism in our age is imperialism, uh, and resisting imperialism is to the benefit of average Americans. Yeah, um, absolutely. That was amazingly well said. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, so when we think about imperialism, we tend to think about, you know, like kings and queens and like going back, you know, just the, the perception, you know, the, the perception of these things. Um, <clears throat> you know, we tend to think, you know, that, you know, we, we tend to think of those things. And when we think of Americans and we think of, you know, American, you know, I don't even, we don't think of it as imperialism, obviously in the mainstream, we think of it as, I don't know, sovereignty or protectorateism or <laughs> Some, something with a lot more honor in it, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, you know, we we tend to think of like, well, you know, the the revolution to, you know, a monarchy system, the revolution, you know, democracy emerged because, you know, against the the systems of monarchy, right? In in the form of capitalism, right? That's the argument that um, that uh, you know, capitalism is and the free market it means freedom politically as well, right? Like that's sort of the lie that we, we've been sold. And, um, you know, we're, so we're at a point now where, you know, that, I, I feel like I lost my train of thought though, I'm so sorry. Um, I can jump in and, and you know, one yeah. thing you talk about, you know, the British empire and the American revolution, the American Revolution, it had many sides to it, but a big part of it was the struggle against imperialism, was that the British, right? The British Empire was basically telling us that the United States couldn't develop economically. We could just had to be kind of a, a trading hub in the global free trade system. And Adam Smith was new in, in Britain and he wrote his book, The Wealth of Nations. Um, and basically they were telling us in the United States, we couldn't develop our own industries. We couldn't have our own economy. Uh, we, we couldn't have our own markets. We had to be just kind of a captive market for the British. And there were a lot of Americans uh, like Alexander Hamilton, like George Washington and others who said, no, we want to develop the economy of the United States. And that was the basis of the disagreement. Now, unfortunately, developing the economy of the United States meant killing all the Native Americans and expanding westward and, and having slavery. So obviously that part we don't agree with. Um, but the idea that, that you know, the economy of the USA should flourish and that we shouldn't just be a temporary you know, temporary holdout, uh, just a, uh, just a, just a, uh, an outpost in their global, you know, in this, this global free trade system. That was a big part of it. And that's what we can get behind. And I, I like Alexander Hamilton a lot. You know, he was against slavery. Uh, he wanted to recognize and do business with the Haitians when the Haitian people, the Haitian slaves broke their chains and overthrew, overthrew the French and, and started having the first, you know, you know, free slave government, uh, you know, that they established in Haiti. He wanted to do business with them. And his model uh, of economics was this idea that, uh, that, you know, the government should spend money on things like lighthouses. The government should stimulate, you know, and pay for providing education and such, and that the state kind of has an obligation to make sure that the wealth and living standards of the population is increasing. Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, he was a free market kind of guy. He said, well, we're going to have a nation of yeomen, of small farmers who just do their own thing and, and they'll be left alone. And that's silly because eventually there's going to be a drought and some farms are going to go out of business and some are going to stay in business. And eventually you're, you're, you're going to have huge farms and, and yeomen that are working for, for big, big farmers. That, you don't, that doesn't work, right? This, you know, every a nation of small farmers, the economic theories of Thomas Jefferson are largely bunk, but Alexander Hamilton's conception that the state should kind of build the economy. Yeah. Alexander Hamilton. Okay, go ahead. 
<laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, the notion that the state should direct the economy to some degree or other to make sure people's lives are getting better, uh, that was a big part of the American Revolution. And I think that's part of the American Revolution we can embrace, right? That idea that that the state does have an obligation to improve people's lives and that we've gotten away from that. You listen to the government now, oh, you're on your own. Like we talked about at the beginning, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's not what Alexander Hamilton was about. That's not what the American Revolution was about. The American Revolution was largely saying, no, our government should be working to raise living standards. Yeah. Well, but it's important also to note that, you know, they're raising living standards off the back of, you know, the underclass, right? Yeah. Yes. So and that's not good, obviously. Yeah, no, but that's that's important because um, you know, that's part of that's part of the myth, right? Like that's part that's where I was going. Like that that's part of the myth that we were sold, right? With that sort of, you know, capitalism and, you know, like these figures like Carnegie and whatever, like they were not aristocracy, right? They were new money, right? That was a huge thing in the early 1900s is new money. And um uh, you know, people were you know, people who had, you know, European aristocracy backgrounds were, you know, snide about those people, but needed them because they ran out of money themselves, right? So, um, you know, we were sold this idea, essentially, that, that we could identify with those kinds of capitalists, right? That because they were not aristocracy, we were, you know, they were sort of the every man and they had been able to rise through, like, you know, through a meritocracy, right? Like they, uh, again, going back to Thomas Frank, he talks a lot about the meritocracy. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we have to, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, capitalism and that revolution brought us a new aristocracy, an aristocracy of industry, right? I mean, now we have the Hiltons and the Kardashians and people who are uber rich from, you know, these capitalist systems, these, these um, you know, corporations. Right. So, um, you know, and we follow them in the same way that, you know, peasants of the medieval times would follow like the goings on of the court and the, you know, or maybe not even medieval, more like Renaissance because of the printing press and stuff. So, you know, I mean, that that kind of stuff was, you know, sensational at the time and they read about it in the papers and they love to talk about it and stuff like that. So, you know, we are doing the same thing with celebrities, with uh, you know, with the hyper rich, Bill Gates, you know, these kind of people. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, we need to, we need to recognize that we are living in an oligarchy in the same way, right? In an oligarchy, in an aristocracy, I think we should call it that. I think we should call it that for sure. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because, you know, we hear this all the time about Andrew Carnegie and all of them. It's like, oh, the, you know, the rich people of the world, they all just worked so hard to get what they have. And socialism is theft. You know, we just want to take what these people have worked so hard for. Bullshit. Bullshit. Right. You know, capitalism began with mass theft. Mass theft. You know, look at that. And, and I mean, I'm talking about, you know, the theft of the Americas from the Native Americans, I'm talking about yes. colonialism in Africa, the slave trade. But beyond that, even in Europe, right? I mean, you know, uh, it's funny. Why, why, if you ever listen to bluegrass music, there's a lot of songs about Charlie, you know, over the river to feed my sheep, over the river. To, who's that? That's Bonnie Prince Charlie. Because in Scotland, the Scottish Highlanders rose up against, against the English. Then after they were defeated, there was a mass genocide in Scotland where they, they cleared all the commons and they just drove all these people off their land and a lot of them fled to the United States. That's why there's so many Southerners and, and West Virginians that have Scottish last names and all of that because they were robbed of their land as British and uh, capitalism was emerging. They threw thousands of people off their land. Read about the clearing of the commons uh, you know, that went on, right? All over Europe when, when, they would, when they would move toward capitalism, they would rip apart the feudal estates. These peasants had lived on this land for thousands of years and they were, you know, basically semi-slaves and peasants that didn't have any rights, but they at least had a place to stay. And all of a sudden the capitalist comes in and says, well, this land's my property. Unless you pay me rent, you're, you're done, right? Henry VIII, King Henry VIII had mass executions of homeless people, right? And you wouldn't hear about this, but, but if you were, you were a vagrant or the crime of vagrancy or vagabondage, 
uh, if you were a vagabond on your third offense, they would hang you. And they and they, he executed tens of thousands of people just for being homeless because all across England, he was going around tearing apart the estates, turning them into private property, creating capitalism, signing them over to some capitalist and, and, and people would have no place to go and then they would get executed. So, you know, um, capitalism began with mass genocide. I mean, mass genocide, in Europe first, and then genocide in, in the Americas, and then genocide in Africa, and, and this notion that they all just worked so hard. I mean, look, uh, how was the but land handed go on, out? Yeah. Go on. I hear that, what, that instance that Henry, uh, Henry with the eighth instance? Yeah. Um, let's compare that to what's going on today, right? I mean, because, I mean, literally, you just described the situation with, you know, uh, banks repossessing houses in BlackRock, right? Um, and uh, like the idea that, um, yeah, oh my God, it just, I, as you were describing that situation, I was just like, this is literally happening right now. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, I mean. It's called uh, primitive accumulation. I mean, this is what yeah. Karl Marx wrote about. This is the, what Karl Marx called the rosy dawn of capitalism, right? It was not about free trade and some people just worked hard and got ahead. Yep. Look, the, the land of the United States, right? It was stolen from the Native Americans, but how did they divvy it up? Was it just a fair process where they just, oh, who wants some land? Oh, you want it? Okay, I guess it's your turn to get some. Of course not. The railroad monopolies and the big oil companies, they scooped it up and they got it all. And, and I mean, it, it, it's always been, capitalism has always been a system of mass theft. Uh, and it always has been. So this libertarian myth that socialism is theft, no, I mean, no, capitalism is theft. Socialism is the creators of the wealth, the working yeah. people, black, white, Asian, Arab, you know, the working people of, of, this, uh, of this country and of the world taking back what their labor has created. That's what socialism is. Socialism is ending the theft and putting the people back in control of the wealth that they themselves have created. Yeah, absolutely. And let's not pretend that the government didn't have a hand in, in uh, you know, essentially wiping out um, Native Americans, taking their land and then redistributing it to all of these private companies that we now laud as pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, right? I mean, these companies didn't just arrive out of nowhere. They were subsidized by the government. They are you know, that's what, well, you know, when we talk about like white people having generational wealth, it's because they literally, you know, the government literally stole it from brown people and then gave it to white people as part of the Homestead Act, as part of many programs, even after World War II, there were many programs for white veterans that there weren't for black veterans. You know, I mean, that's, this is literally an ongoing thing. It's not part of history at current. And, uh, you know, we are, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and socialism, I mean, you know, many Marxists have said socialism is the expropriation of the expropriators, right? That the, the, yeah. the ruling class, they are expropriators. They've stolen everything they have and we simply want to steal it back. I mean, that's, that's, really, that's really what socialism is. We want to steal back uh, what's been stolen from us. Yes, absolutely. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about actually doing it for a second, if you don't mind. So like how, like, how can we, like, I'm not, I'm, I'm a peaceful person. I don't personally think that it is the best of ideas right now to go storming the Capitol and literally killing everybody and then instituting something new, because I think every time somebody does that, they put in something new and then it falls apart in five seconds and then they go, oh, and then another dictator comes into power. So I think, you know, maybe it should be a little bit more of an organic grassroots kind of thing. Maybe we should try and, you know, do something a little more creative than that. Uh, so do, where, what, you know, talk to me about what you think we can do um, to, to start, you know, taking back what is ours. Well, first of all, we have to be very clear that serious revolutionary organizers have always rejected that kind of thing you mentioned there. Terrorism, left adventurism, punchism, Blanquism, these are deviations. When people say, I'm gonna take my little isolated group and we're gonna commit mass acts of violence and somehow that's gonna to lead to something good, they're wrong. Uh, not only is it immorally wrong, but it also doesn't work, right? Generally, when that kind of thing happens, people get scared and afraid and, and stay away from revolutionaries because they think they're dangerous and scary. It creates the basis for a government clampdown on all activism. And a lot of people who aren't, who are doing responsible activism get cracked down on as uh, based on what has happened. So it's, you never want to advocate that kind of thing. Um, you know, socialists and, and revolutionaries have always advocated a peaceful transition to socialism, the building of a broad coalition that will have certain 
demands, certain, you know, certain planks, certain programs that they are, they are fighting for and implementing those things. And in order to implement those things that they're fighting for, we'll need to change the way the government works to make it more democratic and more based in communities. And eventually, as, as a kind of a more democratic government emerges to carry out these demands, uh, that will be the emergence of a whole new social system, right? And that that's, that's the revolutionary process. Um, and, you know, in the United States, I've laid out four economic demands that would improve the United States. The first would be a mass infrastructure program, hire the unemployed to rebuild America, new schools, new highways, high speed railway, you know, new universities, new power plants, new water treatment facilities, America needs a, a high tech makeover. And there's millions of unemployed millennials who are very skilled and, and full of energy uh, that could go do it. Uh, so that's the first step. In order to pay for it, I, I, oh, go ahead. Perfect. Um, I completely 3 million percent believe that we need a federal job program. I think that um, it should be a Green New Deal federal job program. I think, uh, and I also would encourage everyone to go um, take a look at the uh, panel that we just did, um, United Left and Real Progressives. We had a panel on the federal job guarantee. Uh, so if you want to know more specifically about that, take a look at that. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that is amazing. And I think that I, from some of the things I've seen you say about, you know, the millennial generation and how a lot of us are just wasting away at these jobs because we are the most, you know, educated and underemployed generation. I mean, that's a fact, statistically speaking. Um, and we are we are wasting away. Uh, and, um, you know, we need yes, we need the government to, uh, you know, offer us a lifeline. That would be lovely. Um, I also would, after after you go through the four things, and I want you to, to talk a little bit about your uh, Center uh, for Progressive Innovation, is that it? Center like, for Progressive Innovation, yeah, we can we can talk about that for sure. Yes, I'd love to talk more about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I really believe also that we need to think um, about ways that we can do this sort of, you know, with and without the government, because there we've talked a lot about how, you know, uh, electoral politics, how we can sort of try to, you know, sway the government with actions and stuff like that. But we also need a plan where we can sort of like start accumulating wealth for the poor somehow. Like we have to, we have to come up with a way to sort of take it back via the system. It's sort of similar to how, um, the the those meme stocks worked right a little bit a little while ago some uh people on reddit sort of overthrew like two or two hedge companies hedge fund companies um you know it, so we need to come up with more creative ways like that where we can sort of take back what was stolen from us and so i want to get to that eventually but please continue with with well, this yeah Second step would be public ownership of natural resources. You know, this country has loads of oil, has loads of natural gas, has loads of coal and timber, and all of the wealth of this country uh, is privately owned, basically. The natural resources of the country are privately owned and they're, they're run by private companies. And wouldn't it be better if instead of private companies making money off of our oil and gas and timber and coal and natural resources, if instead if instead those things became public property and uh, you know the money, you know the profits from them went into the public budget to pay for things. Uh, the third step would be public control of banking, right? Get rid of the Federal Reserve and that ripoff scheme, uh, you know, uh, you know, and have the lending of money be strategically carried out, you know, at a state, federal, and local level uh, in the interest of the community, right? You know, you know, loan people, you know, give people loans to have their own homes, give people loans to have businesses that would be productive for the community, uh, you know, have the lending of money carried out strategically for the community's benefit, not for the the you know the bank the gain of private interests. Right. And the fourth step would be the enactment of an economic bill of rights. You know, that's what Roosevelt proposed in his final State of the Union address. Uh, you know, the right to a job, the right to housing, the right to education. Those four steps, those those that kind of program in order to enact those four things, you would have to have such a broad mass working class movement. You know, you'd have to have so many people in motion that socialism wouldn't be that far away. Um, you know, and in order to, to, to implement those four demands, the nature of the government would have to change. I mean, we would have to change the way things are set up. So, you know, that, that kind of the mobilization of a broad movement and, and what you talked about before about people caring for each other and people, you know, building their own institutions, community assemblies, community groups, you know, that's a big part of it as well. What is, you know what the word Soviet means in the Soviet Union? It means council. Right. And that's the Bolsheviks in order to carry out the revolution. They built these councils in every neighborhood. And I've been to Venezuela and every neighborhood, every community in Venezuela, they have something called a Bolivarian circle. 
it's called. And in, and in Nicaragua, they call them citizens power councils, where all over the country, there are people who on a local level agree with the overall socialist agenda and are putting it into practice and carrying it out in their neighborhood. And there's kind of a, a back and forth where the leaders of the government are listening to the people at these community assemblies and the people are having input and the people themselves are carrying out the agenda. So they're giving their input and the government is reacting to that. And so it's kind of a, a back and forth. You know, Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese revolution, he said, from the masses to the masses, being that there's constantly a back and forth where you know the masses, you know, the people are talking to the government, the government's talking to the people. That's not happening in our system right now. The government doesn't care what we think. The polls show people are unhappy. They want to end these wars. They want things to get better and the government's just doing its own thing. Well, that has to change. If you're gonna have a government that represents the people against the big monopolies and against the big corporations, it would have to change. As far as the Center for Political Innovation, this is a think tank that I've established. Uh, you know, people asked me a long time ago why I didn't start my own party. Why didn't you start a new party? Well, you know, we have so many socialist parties in this country. You know, there's the, what is it, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, the Socialist Workers Party and the Socialist Labor Party and the Internet Independent Socialist League and the ISO and the QWH and the XYZ and the Fourth Committee of the Twelfth International. And it's silliness. A lot of it's just silliness. A lot of it's just LARPing. Right, But a think tank is something more serious. A think tank can put forward policy proposals and present people with, with kind of education about these issues that could then guide them in mobilizing with different groups and different organizations. You know, People that are building Medicare for all marches can get some orientation and learn about the political process and socialism from the Center for Political Innovation. And then that can guide them in doing what they wanna do. And the same for, for other folks that are organizing. And I have a new approach rather than you know, trying to form another one of these silly internet parties of five of my friends Instead, form a think tank that can print books. We've printed a number of books, uh, you know, have conferences. We were, we've just had some great conferences here in New York. I'm flying out to the West Coast to do it in Santa Barbara uh, next month. And, you know, we're, we're doing a lot, right? But to, to change the conversation, put forward a kind of socialist, anti-imperialist perspective that can guide progressive folks who want to change the country. That's amazing. I fully support that. Um, that sounds great. And, uh, you know, if you're hiring, let me know about it. <laughs> hope that that can be the case very soon so be in touch <laughs> oh yeah please please i am so desperately in need of a, a job that actually pays me money for what i care about <laughs> so nice <laughs> but anyway yeah i mean you're saying some amazing things and i i think that it's so necessary um to you know you know ground the actions that we do um in you know it you know in an overall theory and i do think that it's you know that it's important that we discuss these things. And I, I did online recently get into a fight over sort of like, you know, like theory over, uh, you know, everyday problems to people. I mean, cause it's, it's hard when you, when you are really struggling and I've been in this situation when you are like essentially homeless or sleeping on somebody else's couch or, you know, having food insecurity when you're literally saying, okay, well, I'm counting pennies because hopefully I can get you know, a, a hamburger from the dollar menu, then it's really, really hard to care about Marx. You know, yeah. it's really hard to research this stuff. And especially since it was written, you know, two, 200 years ago at this point, um, it's, it's, it's hard for a lot of people who don't have a, a background in this stuff to really understand it or care or care to understand it. Right. So it's, it's important to, to, um, you know, make sure that that we are communicating these concepts in a way that people can really grasp on into their everyday life, because you're absolutely right that, you know, these things are not intangible, like these things are, 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 are around us every day, and they're influencing what happens to us every day. And we see it on a, on a minuscule level. But when we understand it on a macro level, then we can really understand, you know, exactly what's happening to us right and, and and exactly the different ways that we need to um that we need to attack the situation essentially and i mean i i would be very interested to discuss um you know i i, I would want to learn more about different ways that we could um sort of you know form socialist you know organizations in a way that you know like i i'm i'm interested in uh like you know stock buy buybacks like worker stock buybacks i'm interested in seeing uh you know like we have to build unions first like that's number one we have to build unions we have to build mutual aid networks that's that's number two because if we want to do anything close to a general strike and i did talk to uh 
uh, awkward about this recently on my channel. Um, that, uh, you know, we have to be able to build a mutual aid networks. We have to be able to support the workers that won't be working um, when they, you know, when they're, they hit zero dollar. Um, so, you know, these are, these are important structures that I, I hope that the left is working on first. That's our first step, I think, is to, to, to take this stuff more seriously and, and get more organized. Um, and I definitely think, uh, you know, once, once we get there, we can really start thinking about um, you know, taking ownership of these companies, right? Like, like Amazon is a perfect example. Amazon actually supports a lot of small businesses in, in the, in the tech world that would have been, you know, completely dead uh, if they, you know, they wouldn't have made the technical transition if it weren't for Amazon. Right. I mean, a lot of, you know, uh, people who, um, drop ship from China, a lot of people who, uh, you know, are self publishers, uh, small publishers, things like that. I mean, you know, Amazon really does a lot for them. And um, we, you know, need those services, but we don't need to have, you know, a, a guy shooting himself to space for $10 billion. what <laughs> literally looks like a space penis um, for fun. Uh, while the rest of his workers are starving and literally dying in factories and then having other people step over them to continue work. I mean, like, that's not okay. I mean, that's literally what we thought of the medieval ages, right? Literally what we think of when we think of feudalism and, and the monarchy, right? Like, that's, you know, not okay. So we really, you know, I, I would love to see us talk more about how we can use um, the capitalist system to sort of, you know, reclaim um, reclaim our, our, our efforts because we, because Amazon is not Jeff Bezos because Amazon is something that we've built collectively and we need to be able to take back ownership of that. Indeed. Well, we'll have to talk about that next time because the time is sure. not going to depart. Um, but, uh, but let's do this again sometime. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. It's been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Yeah, you're doing great work. I'm really glad I could record and, and get your speech to, to thousands of people to hear what you had to say. Uh, great work with Medicare for All and Millennial Splaining and all that. So I'm out for now, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been great. We'll be in touch. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah.